Boy, it's good to have all of you come. What a fantastic group of growers that we have here today. And we had a tremendous day yesterday. We got all the kinks out, so hopefully it'll run really, really smooth for you. And it's a pleasure to have you. You know, it's talking to some growers ahead. But I don't think there's anything that we can't fix here today in agriculture. We're covering four countries. We got France, Russia, Australia and Canada here and 24 states, so we ought to be able to fix about anything that goes wrong. Maybe we ought to call Washington and tell them to turn it over to this group, and I think we'll, we'll have it figured out, won't we? But we're excited that you're here. We're going to have a great weather day. You know, I got friends that work in-town jobs, and they tell me that after a year or two of their job, they get it kind of figured out, the pattern. You know, they have the budgeting season, the sales season, then the production season, then it repeats again. And so all of us have that type of friends and careers, whether they're a nurse, electrician, uh, you know, insurance agent. And then there's farming. You know, sure, you know, winter follows fall and spring follows winter and then summer follows spring, but that's about it. And after that, it's just totally different. You know, last year at this time, we were talking about rain and serious rain. We we're talking about rain that delayed planting, rain that created axle deep ruts, rain that had gray leaf and northern blight like we've never seen before, and then rain all across the nation that washed nitrogen out and created quite a challenge on corn that was flat running out of end. So it starved our crops. In fact, even after Christmas, we had rain. Two days after Christmas for New Year's, where we were sitting last year at this time at my home dairy, it would have been where the dot is there, you were 10 feet underwater. And so it was quite a year, wasn't it? And certainly and thankfully, every year is different. I enjoy the challenge. 14 is different than 13, it's different than 12. And this year, we had a completely different set of challenges. You know, some of you had early planning for many, some late frost for some. I think if we're honest, all of us, certainly in this area, should have taken mom on Mother's Day weekend out for dinner instead of running planters. Because that is the problem field all the way through for us. And so there's drought in areas. Talked to Laddie, Ohio. Yesterday talked to Northern Indiana. Ohio and Michigan, and I understand there's some dry. At the same time, early this morning, some of the first growers in from Missouri said, never been better. We're going to have some serious corn. So we're very fortunate. The good Lord has provided the heat and the rain and the sunshine. And in return, our soils have given us back a tremendous gift of nitrogen. Through mineralization, Science will tell you that there's about 15 to 20 pounds of free nitrogen per percentage point of organic matter. So if you're sitting here in the tent and you have a 4% organic matter, you could have well over 100 pounds of nitrogen. And believe me, here in, in this area, in central Illinois, we're getting that and more. And so my system, I'm talking about how do we take advantage of this gift? When we started out the season, we said we're going to need 260 pounds to raise the 250 bushel of corn. But the way our system is set up with multiple, multiple passes of feeding, we were able to knock off the fourth trip through and saved us 100 pounds of in, $50 an acre, and for our operation, that's over $100,000 in Greg's back pocket that I didn't have to spend. So any time that we can design a system where the longer it goes to make a decision, the better off we're going to be. You know, our cropping plan has flexibility pay, built into it. So either last year we were penalized of a lot of rain, we could react, or this year where we're given a free gift, we can react. But I do believe this. If you're sitting here today, and you make a nitrogen cropping plan a year ahead and you follow that. And I'm worried for you how you're going to survive in the next coming days, in the next coming years. We have to have the ability to deal with weather. Weather's the biggest variable we got. 
And we get really good, don't we, predicting weather after the fact. You know, it's kind of like the corn markets. I am the best marketer a day after the report comes out. And I think all of you would agree to that. And so whether we have an early summer of high heat or whether we have a, you know, a feast of the perfect rainfall and extra nitrogen, whether we have cloud cover or sunshine, that's what the challenge is for you and I as growers is how do we react? You know, last year our proving ground site late in the year was underwater, so we said we need to move. We need to move from down at the home place there in the dairy to a site that would have a less risk. And so this is our first year here. This is a 187-acre site. And it's a good thing we moved because we came home on Sunday evening after the grandparents of supper. Nine o'clock in the evening, it started to rain, and I mean the wind blew, and it rained in 20 minutes, two and a half inches on July 21st. And you ought to see where the proving grounds was going to be. And this will make your heart hurt and makes your stomach tighten up. Tremendous corn, well over 300 bushel potential, 13 and a half feet tall, is flat on the ground where we would have been working. And so I'm glad we always have an alternative plan. And so this was the A plan, that was going to be the B plan. B plan is now going to go into the dairy in silage bags because I don't think we're going to have a combine that's going to pick some of that up very well. So we've been working all year to make this a good day for you. So I'm really glad you come. And I'm glad you made the trip. And I'm glad you're here to work with us and talk about how we're going to get better. I believe the producers in this room will feed the world by raising 300 bushel. You're the, as good as they get. You're the best of the best. And so I know we can get there. We have growers in here that are raising right now in Texas 300 bushel. We have growers from Fort Wayne, Indiana in tough soils and really good years that can hit 250. So I know you have that kind of potential. And I know that we can boost production. And I believe all my heart, we don't need regulation from Washington to tell you how much anhydrous ammonia you need to put on. Because we all make the right environmental decisions. I eat where we grow. Our family drinks the water where we grow. And we're all raising a healthy crop of good-looking kids, aren't we? And so, but most of all, most of all, I believe we're the luckiest people in the world to be in farming. You know, the next generation of kids that eat at our supper table every night, they're the ones that are going to make it happen. You got to get excited when you look around your supper table and realize with the passion they have and the energy they have and the technology that is brought in from agriculture, we will make sure that everybody has enough to eat. So no matter what Mother Nature is going to throw at us, we're going to talk today about how do we react and how do we get good at what we do. And what we do is we raise our families and we raise corn and soybeans and, and we cover every cot every crop in here from cotton to sunflowers. We cover it all in this tent today. So let's get started and let's talk about where do we go and how do we do it. You know, if you were with me last January at our open house at the Yield Center, I did a session that said, let's get back to farming. The days are over where we have the option just to throw down $500 at one time per acre and make decisions. I challenge you to say, let's analyze each decision. Let's lay $100 down at a time when we're talking about inputs. And so as you look at this road sign, it's saying take a sharp right. I'm asking you to go straight ahead and into your cornfield and start to analyze. Today is about not your neighbor sitting next to you. It's about you, me and you, myself. How do I really go into my cornfield and analyze what's happening? When I walk in there, am I ready to say, does my system need to get better? Because I can't change the Chicago Board of Trade price. If corn went up two or down three today, I have no control. But what I do have control of is what's happening in the field. And so when you walk in there and you start to take a look at corn, what are the things you're going to look for? Well, obviously, you're going to want uniformity. Usually when I go in, the first thing I do is I look down at the ground and I just see, am we're going to have even stalk size. Are we going to have where the planter put everything singulated and it's even? Then I quickly go to the top 
And I just start at the top and I count down leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's where you want your ear set. If you told me you walked in your corn and it's on the eighth node, it doesn't mean you're a bad grower. It means this plant's had a bad day. The highest yields always come from the highest ear set. That's on the seventh node. And so those are things you look for. And you look for uniformity and you're going to, you know, you're going to look to say, well, what's happening at this plant? It's talking to us. Where's this leave at? You know, is it telling us that we don't have any nitrogen efficiency? You can start to see a little bit showing up right here. And you can see it right here. It's starting to show up. And so when you go in the field and you see this plant here in the bottom that you see in the PowerPoint, it's talking to us. And it's saying, this field is starting to run out. The gas tank's starting to get empty. For years, we've talked to you how you take your jackknife and you would take and split a corn plant and you can split it down. And inside that corn plant, Tim, inside that corn plant, we split a corn plant, and what are you looking for in there? When the nitrogen starts to run out, of this plant, it'll pull down from the top, come all the way down, and it comes down to the bottom. And so at this stage, this plant's not that far from harvest, and you can see we got one, two, three nodes that are totally clean yet. What's that mean? That means this grower's on his game. He fed this plant correctly. The styrofoam here means that that is depleted. If we take that styrofoam, like last year, all the way to the bottom, and we take the plug out of this plant, and we take the styrofoam all the way here, there's no longer any safety for root problem diseases that come in. And standability almost instantly becomes a problem. And so you and I are in charge as factory managers. We're saying, are we managing our crop correctly? And are we taking a look at what's happening there at that stage? I'm in a field here that's a strip-till field. And you take a look at this and you say, well, what happened here? We're walking down these 30-inch rows, and all of a sudden we see five feet of small nubbins. Any of you there in strip till knows what happened. That planter shifted off the sweet spot, the zone you created that's perfect for planting. And when that planter shifts off, immediately the row, clean, the row units come up. It's now no-tilling instead of soft till, you know, planting. And you can see the cost. And there's five years here that it would have knocked that yield back tremendously. And so these are things that you analyze your own. And you say, well, if I'm going to strip till, how am I going to design a planter to hunt no matter where I'm at? In my opinion, if you'd have had some technology that's out there where instantly your downforce would have reacted, you'd have probably had one plant off instead of five. And so those are things you look at. What else you look at? Everybody talks about ear count. Everybody says, want lots of ears. This grower's in 30-inch rows. He's got 37,000 plants. Really tight in there. He didn't manage his nitrogen. You can see it on the plants. As you go up the plant, it can totally runs out. And you start to look at the yield, and you look at his ears, and they were starting to pull back. You hand check it in the neighborhood, a lot of corn, seriously over 200. This corn is checking at 189. Did he overreach? Probably. He aggressively said, well, if yield comes from ears, I just need to get more ears. And it's true that ears do make yield. You look at this photo and you see these kind of ear count. This is over 40,000 ear count. But it comes with understanding how do we position it for success? You can't just say in a 30-inch cropping season, well, I'm going to plant 40,000 kernels. And I figure if I drop 40,000, I'm going to get 40,000 ears. Then you better feed that crop. And so these are things that we look for. And we say, you know, how do we manage that accordingly? And what is the right row spacing? You know, we look at 30s, and then we look at 20s, and we say, where's the future? We've been researching twin, twin 20s. And I'll just be honest with you, I kind of hope it doesn't go there because it's not easy. It's a whole set of challenges. <clears throat> so why would row spacing, besides the ear count, what are we looking for in that type of environment? And what we're really looking for is how does this plant performing? And so this right here is your factory, gentlemen. And as a factory manager, you need to be on your game. This has been a tremendous creation from our good Lord. And so this leaf is working. As the sun comes down and hits this leaf, it transpires just like you and I are going to transpire when we get out in the cornfield this afternoon. 
As this leaf transpires, guess what it does? It pulls up water. So as the plant transpires, it starts to pull water, and it pulls water so all these leaves are catching sunlight. And it pulls water. There's roots in here eight feet deep. You can obviously see where our water level is. The guys in the front row, if they were six inches further down at their feet, that's where the water table is in this field. So if we can get roots to migrate down in here, we have our own irrigation system, don't we? Now, it just so happens, this happens to be drip irrigation. You can see we cut the first line here. That line's 20 inches under. We had to cut the first line right there to get this pit put in. We'll put it back. But this plant has the ability to draw water if we understand how to protect this leaf. And so as the sun shines on this leaf, it starts to draw water. Let's talk about how much water that we can draw up because it does make a difference. You go in certain parts of the country and they have tremendous ability for a plant to draw water. You go in the high plains of Texas. We got a farm down there that we work with. And in that Texas environment, in the high plains, they get up to about 101 degrees during the day. We get down to 58 degrees at night. Got to like that. That's a good scenario. Sun shines on this plant all day. Very, very low humidity. And the water pump is on overdrive. It can pull up. 0.75 inches of water a day. How about the three surrounding states, Iowa, Illinois, the I states, Indiana, what do you think we can pull up a day? Quarter of an inch. You've been watching the Olympics, you think this is a fair race? Who do you think is going to win? The more water in, the more nutrients in. And so then you come to this year, 2016, and we've had a tremendous summer, and we've had brilliant sunshine. And there was a stretch in here where we had low humidity and high temperatures, and all of a sudden, Central Illinois become the high plains of Texas. And you look at where our technology is with our irrigation monitoring systems, and so the quarter-inch line, you can see right here, and look, we went over a half inch some days of water. And you say, well, is that why we're raising some serious corn? Yeah. Nature worked for us this year. 2014, the same thing. 2008, the same thing. And then 2012, that would have been a totally different thing, wouldn't it? And so what we're saying is you and I have to manage sunlight. When we talk about row spacing, it's all about this. If you and I are in 30-inch rows, maybe we ought to use another sheet of paper. So we got these plants here and they're 30 inches apart. And we know that it's going to pull up 25 hundredths or a quarter of an inch a day. But if there's sunlight in your field and the sunlight's getting through directly, this is 2x what this plant will use per day evaporation wise. So yesterday, a lot of guys would come up to me and say, Greg, I'm going to switch planters. Do I need to go to 20 inch? I said, I don't know. If you can manage in a 30-inch system the right hybrid with the right shape of leaves, with the right amount of sunlight capture, you and I should say, what's the goal? 98%. In Greg's field, I walk in there and I say, I don't want over, I want 98% shade. That's what I'm looking for. If I see any sunlight hitting the ground, that's a problem. And that's something we're worried about. So all corns are created, you know, they're not all created equal. They're all different. Take a look at this corn here that we're throwing up. It's a brand new experimental. And that company is saying the corn of tomorrow is going to be shorter than some of the hybrids today. I don't know what this is. Let's pretend it's seven and a half feet. I should have measured it. But this corn is a lot shorter than this guy here. See a difference? Look where the ear set is here. Greg at his best can just touch it. I got about 50 acres of this in a 100 acre field. Guess where this was at the dairy? 70 mile an hour winds and two and a half inches of rain in 20 minutes. Where do you think happened to this guy? So who's the fault? Is the company that designed it? Or is it Greg that planted it 
and didn't quite understand how tall it was going to get under high intense management. This is an irrigated field. This field is spoon fed. This field has everything it needs. Now you got to get excited. There's 39,000 ears like this. But the problem is where I cut it off, I lost an inch or two. I mean, I can barely reach the top of it. That's a train wreck about to happen, isn't it? So they're different. Where's the corn of tomorrow going to be? Well, I believe it's going to go this way. If we go back to that picture and you look at this corn, look how it's designed. The top, one, two, three, four, five, six. The top six are very, very straight. Why is that? Well, they're trying to get sunlight deep into the canopy. If every one of these are a factory, then you and I, as professional growers, want the sunlight to get as deep as we can. And then at the last second, we say, stop. And that's what this corn is. We got this corn at 50,000. It's checking 360 bushel. It's the corn of tomorrow. I'm excited about it. The picture that's up, the picture's not up there. I'm sorry, I see that. So, so what we're doing is we're going to say the corn tomorrow is going to have a very vertical leaf. If that's true, then the row spacing is going to have to start to take a different look. And I'm not smart enough to tell you that it's going to be 20s, it's going to be 24s, it's going to be twin 20s. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be. But you and I are going to need to start thinking about it because that's the direction we're going to head. If you're sitting in the pit today and you say, you know what, I'm going to be like the two-year-old that was in church next to you last Sunday that was really mad and he told his daddy he's going to hold his breath till he gets his way. If you're saying this $3 corn market, I'm going to hold my breath and I'm not going to look at my farming system. I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to hold my breath till it goes back to $4. Good luck. I hope you got big lungs. You and I, if we're going to raise our family successfully, we better figure out how to be profitable in farming and $2.85 and $3 corn. And I'm here to tell you, you can. You can. But all this stuff matters. How we capture sunlight. Look at this next photo. How do we protect the factory? If you and I are saying, well, we did a really good job and it come to be about June 15th and we went to the picnic and we got really tired of walking in cornfields and we let gray leaf take that factory out, shame on us. I'm holding a leaf up here in this next photo and we're in this field and it was sprayed with headline amp to try to stop it, but it looks to me like it was just a touch late because this is the ear leaf. And so when you look at this guy, this is an ear leaf. This is, your go this is your golden ticket. This corn here has been sprayed twice, and you can still see gray leaf on it. And so we have an environment here of the continuous rains and cloudy weather. We've got an environment where we're struggling. I have to protect this guy because all day long, it's taking and creating energy, and it's feeding what? The ear. This has a tremendous impact on the tip and what's fed in the end. And so we talk about light. You can take your iPhone. There's a little app out there. You just go into Apple, and for $1.99, you can get your iPhone, just like a professional photographer. You can get Lumas. And I'm in the cornfield here. This is a 30-inch grower, 34,000 plants. And I'm taking my iPhone, and I'm just pointing about a foot above the ground, and I snap a shot, and it says 1709. Put that in relationship, I looked it up on the internet, that's equal to a 65 watt light bulb. But look where we went to our narrow row corn that's planted at 40,000, 71% darker, where we are capturing what? A lot more energy. So my job today is to challenge you to think about what are the next steps? As professional growers like you are, you gotta continuously say, where do I go next? I'm going to challenge you out in my session. You can start thinking about it, and I'm going to ask some of you. On the way home, your job tonight is to say, if I had unlimited money, money was not an issue, what are the top three things I would do in my operation to take the next step ahead and yield if the grain prices want to stay in the 350 level? And so that's, your, that's what you should be thinking about today. What are the things that Greg and Cindy need to do in Tremont, Illinois at Townline Farms? And for Rich Slip. And for Mark Schlater and all you guys that are here, that's your job, is to figure out the next step. What else do you look for in the field? Well, as you're looking at ears and you see this kind of silk growth, you start to get a little nervous. You realize this corn's not pollinating. Something's going on here. Either a pollen shed, most likely rain, most likely really cloudy weather. And then you see the ear itself, 
and you realize we no longer can count this ear at 42 long. Where you see that type of a color change, where my pin is, that's it. So when you're taking kernel checks, what we lose there? One, two, three, four, five, six. What six ears mean? Or six kernels mean in length? It's serious. So we have an ear here. And every kernel in length equals six bushel. This is why you got to be on your game. This is why you're protecting your top leaves. This is why you're worried about pollination. How long did pollination go? Guess what? May 6th, Mother's Day, those fields, that's where that ear's from. Not only did we have trouble planting it, not only should we plant that weekend, then nature come in and it nailed us and it took out eight kernels, 48 bushel hit there due to just the luck of the draw, but we eliminated all these. They pollinate it much later than the rest of these guys and there's a color change. So when you count, you stop right there and you kiss this goodbye and you say, man. And that's why we spread out maturity. That's why we don't plant one corn all the way through the field in two days. We hedge our bets, don't we? And so these are things you look at. If you'd have came in this field, one of the things you should do, put that next picture up, Tim. And you see right here, we're counting kernels around. Well, as you count around that ear, what are each one of these rows worth to you? 10 bushel. So the first thing I do when I go in a field, I grab an ear and I say, do the kernels line up from the butt to the tip? If they do, you're a class A farmer. You got it going because you did not stress this corn. Anytime corn has a bad day, anytime it has a bad day, you're in trouble. Soybeans, totally different, guys. You can stress, but we intentionally, you can't believe how much cobra went on here for water hemp in the area at the right time to take out all kinds of escape weeds. And we made beans really mad, and beans will set on more pods. You make corn really mad, and it's going to take two off. I've seen it time after time. You walk in a field and an inch up, they're 18 at the bottom, 16 here, 20 bushel loss. Most times, you can't blame this on weather. It goes right back to Greg. Wrong tillage pass, wrong herbicide, not managing my factory out there the best that I can. Let's talk about tools. What kind of tools are available to us? So this is a field that I was watching all summer. We had a stretch in here of two weeks. Remember I told you we had, you know, some heat that came in. And all the agronomists in the area said, well, Greg, if we're going to have heat, it's the right time. Corn was anywhere from thigh to here to your leg muscle up to your shoulder. And most agronomists said, if you're going to have heat, it's a good time to have it. It's not going to hurt the corn. I'm watching this field. I drive by it a lot. At 9 o'clock in the morning, it started to curl. It curled really tight at 3 o'clock. This picture's taken at 3 o'clock. And that corn is rolled, and it's under stress. And I'm just sitting there going, there's an irrigation. There's actually three irrigation system in this field, and they never moved for two and a half weeks. And I'm like, maybe it's just me. Electricity is not that expensive. We got all the water that we need in this particular location. We should be pumping water. We should be taking this field off of stress. What did I just tell you about unhappy corn? This corn's unhappy, but the agronomist in the area was telling them, don't worry about it. Right across the road, we have a resale search field, and it's 150 acres of drip irrigation. How much water do you think I was putting on every day in this field? If, if I tell you that it pulls up, I was putting on a quarter of an inch every day underground. We're just taking it in there and we're just letting it feed. This is the same exact time at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 40,000 plants. Are these plants under stress at 95 degrees? It was 96 degrees when we took that picture. These plants are happy. And you say, well, does it really translate to anything? And I'll show you the drip line here. When you look at the drip underneath, you can see those roots are feeding where? Right at the buffet table, they're pretty happy. So we're spoon feeding a quarter inch of water. We're giving, oh yeah, today we gave it 10 pounds of nitrogen. Oh, we threw in a little sulfur. Every time we make a nitrogen application, we add sulfur. 10 to 1. 30 gallons of nitrogen, 3 gallons of sulfur, okay? 50 gallons of nitrogen, 5 gallons of sulfur. 10 to 1 ratio. 
So anytime we add drip water in these fields, it gets a snippet of sulfur in it. We might throw in a little boron or manganese. It's kind of one of these fun things that you can do to make corn really, really happy. So we go back a little later on in this field across the road, this 30-inch corn, and you can see there's stress there. And I'm not sure I'm buying that corn's okay being stressed really hard at shoulder high because if you take the ears out and you look at that, that's 34,000, and you look at the ears, the difference between those two fields, that's 72 bushels, real money. And so those are things, I and mean, there's are tools at our disposal. We need to react. We need to be there at the field. We need to be watching. That's your job. That's what you're getting paid for. Other tools that you have. You know, you take a planter, so we did this a lot this spring because we're in seed corn production. In seed corn production, the field man comes and says, it's been three days since a female went in. You need to plant male corn today. And you say, well, it's going to really rain tonight. Plant male corn today. And you plant it, and then it gets cemented in. We'll take the planter. We don't run rotor hose anymore. I take our planter. We run it right back over the top of that male corn. We set it at the lowest setting, about a half inch in depth take a lot of the pressure off the row unit, the spike wheels in the back, we put on notch one, and it'll beat a rotary hoe any day. So don't be scared to take your planter out. If you have a 16 row planter and your corn's all cemented in, if a half inch of crust, I'd take a planter runner across the top of her again. The neighbors will think, well, man, I thought he planted that once. He must be planting again. It'll crack that right open. It's the simplest thing you can do. So there's all kinds of tricks and all kinds of ways to do it. Let's talk weather. Like I told you, weather is the biggest influence on our farm. And it's the thing that happens of nature that you and I can't control. So we need to position ourselves to whatever's coming. And I look at this storm coming, and I don't know if this is an inch or three inches or a half inch, but I can tell you that's boot high corn. At boot high corn, remember what I said? At boot high corn, it's deciding whether it's going to be what? At boot high, it's deciding at V6 whether it's going to be 18 around, 16 around, 14 around, heaven forbid, 12 around. And so as we look at this rain coming across this field, your belly gets a little tight. And you say, I wonder if I'm going to be okay where my nitrogen program is at this moment. And let's look at the different years. Let's just pick three years. Because we had the bookend years this year. Last year we had, in 15, one of the wettest seasons in history. In 16, I will tell you for our farm, it's the best that I've ever seen, bar none. I have never seen this kind of mineralization and free nitrogen given. I've never seen it where the temperatures and the moisture could be this perfect. So we have the two extremes, which I really, really like for 360 Yield Center because we're coming out and telling you, we're raising our hand really high. We're saying, hey, look at us. We believe we have a system that you should implement. Whether you should come in and you should do more mid and late season in when the plant really wants it. And so it's exciting for us to see the two extremes. And then there's 2012. And for Greg, that was as painful as 1988. You know, 1988 was the first year Cindy and I farmed on our own. What a year to start as a young farm couple. Three little kids in 1988, the drought of the century, and it was stressful. But 2012 was worse for me. And 2012, we're picking in here, and this one here has an ear. But there were stretches in that field. That's 20-inch corn. And it, it was just painful because... We had already put everything in the game. We had everything staged for 250 bushel, and it didn't rain. One of the guys from Laddie, Ohio, said we've had four inches since planting. I feel for him. That's not good. We had 2.3 inches the whole growing season on 1,200 acres down by 136 here, south of here, 20 miles. We could go 500 feet with an 18-row corn head and never have an ear come in the combine. So that's the extremes, isn't it? And so how do you and I plan? Because we got to go out with gusto. It comes April 1st, and we need to plant. And so let's take a look at some of the different things and challenges we have. And so here's April's rainfall for four different years. You got 2012 in yellow and 2014 in blue. It's as good as it ever gets. 
2015, the wettest on history, and then there's 2016. And at this stage on April 1st, that month of April, everything looks pretty much the same. And this is a challenge. When you say, Greg, I'm going to do once and done nitrogen in November, you need to share with me, how are you smart enough in November to know what it's going to take to finish the race for September? I, I don't understand that. I've watched my neighbors do that, and I say, how can you be smart enough? So what do you do? You overspend. You say, well, it could be a really wet year. Instead of putting on 220 pounds of anhydrous, I think I'll kick it up to 240, and I'll throw some NSERV in. And you're done. You check the box. Or you might do it all ahead of the planner. And at this stage, you're struggling to really know what are the next squares that are going to get filled out. Because 2016 at this stage is drier than 2012. So should you panic or not? And then we add another month of May. And you can start to see it separating. And you can see the green line taken off. That's 2015. But the other three years on May 30th, are exactly alike. And for years, that's when Greg would side dress nitrogen to finish the program. So I would lick my finger and put it up in the wind and say, I think we need 100 more pounds. Really? I wasn't that smart. If it needed 85, I'd put 100 on. You probably can get, figure that out with the guy I am. I always padded it, which cost me like eight to nine dollars an acre more than I didn't even know if I needed it. But I would pad it because I said, well, what if? Well, I want to make sure we get enough yield. And then we look at June. And you can see June now, of these four years, there's quite a separation in there. But 012, the drought here of 100 years for me, and 16 are still pretty much alike on June 30th. You can see where 15 took off, and then you can see the beautiful year of 2014 where everything's just running sweet. And then we click up July, and now you understand why July 4th, all of you are going, yeah, because what? The whole nation got, what, two inches? I call it a billion-dollar rain. Watching the 4th of July fireworks is so much fun when you just had two inches. I mean, everybody's smiling. And so as you watch it play out here, and then we put in August what we know today, and so at this stage... You can see the rest of the year, and you can see where we're at in 16. And so we've separated from 12, haven't we? And we're up more almost to where 14 was. And you go out and look at yield projections, and you can start to see that play out. Let's pick apart 2012. So I said early on, it was ideal. We planted 38 to 39,000. We put our nitrogen on. We come in on June 3rd and we side dress the rest of the program. We had 250 pounds of nitrogen on total because we were going for 255 corn. And it looked like we were going to make it. I remember talking to Aaron and that day he was side dressing. I said, our plant count is perfect. It's the best stands we've ever had. I said, we're dry, but it'll rain soon. And it never did. Look at the cracks that we experienced in those fields. Remember the old days and they used to go out in the river and cut ice blocks? That's what happened in our fields. Our heavy clays here, these sables and ipavias, they will collapse down. So if you're having a dry summer, this soil shrinks down and gets really tight density in here. And it gets tighter and tighter spore spacing. And so it slams down. It happens every summer. That's why we do tillage in the fall. We come in of tillage to do what? To reset the density. Why do we do that? Well, we want roots just to migrate down the following season. But in this case, when you see this, we just set that spade in there for convenience. Didn't know where else to set it. We just dropped it in the crack. 18 inches deep. Every 20 inches, we had an ice block. If you could have put a ground anchor in there, you and I could have probably picked that baby up, probably been 150 pounds of soil. But what's happening in here to every root when you think about the roots that are going through here, and this is Ken Ferry, my consultant, and Ken and I are talking about this, and I said, Ken, how much did this cost me? He said, well, it's hard to say, he said, but every root, if you look down the crack, we were shining a light down there, he said, every root snapped 18 inches away from the plant all the way around, he said, probably 50 to 80 bushel, and I said, that's not going to happen again, and they all kind of laughed at me. I remember when I was harvesting corn, and it was nothing coming in the combine. I called Cindy and I said, I'm done. 
we're changing this program. I said, we're not laying all of our money out here again like this and getting 69, 69 bushel, field after field, that was on a 250 course. I said, I'm not farming that way. And she said, well, what are you going to do, play God? And I said, no, we're going to put drip irrigation in. I said, because I know in California and areas of Kansas where they put drip in, and I believe if we put drip in, we won't get soil to collapse down. So the first challenge I had, and we started installing drip. So this is the first field we ever put in. We're putting in at 18 inches. Everybody said, well, that won't work. That's way too deep. Well, that's wrong. This field's at 21 inches. See this right here? That's 21 inches in. Why? Well, because Greg's going to come in and do tillage here. This is corn on corn. I want to make sure we don't hit it. And we've documented a lot of research that water goes up twice as fast as it comes down. And so the first task for drip for me was, would it keep the ground from cracking? And yes, it will. It will not let the ground open up and snap your roots. So I, was, I said, that's quite a victory. And after that, you can see it here in this pit. You can see we're on 40-inch spacings. And now we can spoon feed nitrogen and nutrients and water just as we need to let it go. So let's talk about other years. That's 2012. 2015, man, we rolled at the exact opposite of 2012. We had water everywhere. You look here where we're sitting, and you can see right where we're sitting here. You're sitting right here. So this field is pattern tiled. For years, we farmed this field. We've only owned it for two but we farmed it for 20. There's eight acres in here. Due to the highway, they ruined it. The water used to go this way over here to the lake. No longer could it go there because the lake got too high when they put the highway in. So now we had eight acres we never could raise a crop in. So we pattern tiled this, and man, does it work. This is a two and a half inch rain that you see right here. Go ahead, Tim. It rained two and a half inches. That's an 18 inch smooth wall. And you look at the kind of water we're taking off this 187 acres, a massive amount of water. We've pulled the plug on it, didn't we? So our pattern tile, we're going 36 inches deep of tile. We're going in right over the top of that with drip tape at 21 inches. And now we got a system, I'm just ready to play defense or offense. Rain's too much, let the tiles run. Rain is not enough, we turn the drip on. So we're going to show you some of the tile machines running. We're going to talk about bioreactors. We're going to talk about what Washington's trying to do with regulation on tile. We're going to give you a snippet of what the things are. But look at this field here. We talk about drainage. A hundred bushel difference in that spot that's yellow compared to green. And you're going to hear Jim Hedges talk about it. And we're going to talk about peaks and valleys. When you and I are in the farming business, this is what kills us right here. These right here. And you go through a cornfield with your yield monitor, and that's a half mile long, and it's not uncommon to see, what, 125 bushel swings up and down? Many of you said, Greg, I saw 300 in the same pass. I saw 185. Remember that? So the task for you and I are to level it all out up here and get rid of these guys that are low. And so that, that's the challenge we have. So these are the things that we look at and we say. So at 360, we believe no matter what the year, nitrogen is the key. So whatever the year we're looking at. So remember in 2012, because we went early, we overspent. And so in 2015, we had nitrogen loss. And you can see it here, and we go up in the, in the field. And so you can see the nitrogen loss here that comes into place. And then 2016, we have the free gift of nitrogen, and you look at that ear, and that's one happy ear. You don't see any kernels pulled back. There's no six bushel per kernel loss on this guy. The, the kernel size is going to be huge. So what's the answer to this? And I'm going to make a brass statement. Over the last two years, I've been working on this concept of time. The sprayer, in my opinion becomes the tool of choice over anything else we own. What you just see running up there gives me every option I need. And I well realize some of you cannot afford to own your own sprayer. And I have no problem with that. But everyone in this tent, when they leave here tonight, needs to align with an ag retailer, a neighbor, a friend, or get their own. Because in my estimation, this is what's going to change ag for us. The ability to go in a crop at any given time, play defense if the leaves are getting diseased. Insects are in, we spray. 
The main thing is nitrogen. We can start to spoon feed, no different than the drip. What I'm doing underground with drip, which by the way is way too expensive, it's not something I'd recommend at all. $2,300 an acre to put it in, and it's the ugliest baby you've ever seen in the park. I mean, you can't even look at drip and say it's got pretty eyes. It's, it's nasty to put in. You're going to be up your armpit in the spring fixing mouse holes and areas. It's just, but at the same time, you get pretty excited about it when you see the corn you can raise with it. But if we own this, why can't we go in and start to manage at the right time when we need to? Let's look at what it would be. We talk about pounds of nitrogen per bushel. The industry tells you what? The industry tells you that it's going to be 1.1, and they're right. It takes 1.1 pounds of nitrogen to raise a bushel of corn. That's just the facts. But if you and I, through timing and placement, can start to work down here, down this list, what if all of us could be in the 0.7 club? That's pretty exciting, isn't it? You save $70 an acre on nitrogen. If you wanted to raise 200 bushel corn and you're in the 0.7 club, you only needed 140 pounds to do it. But to me, that wouldn't make any sense. Why wouldn't we want to put 220 pounds on and be a 0.7 clubber and raise 315 bushel? Because if we have the knowledge, you have the ability to continue to use the same amount of nitrogen, we're just going to get much more efficient. And your yields are going to go up, and you didn't have to spend any more money. And so that's what we want to take a look at. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about base plus. Base plus is where we're at 360. You're saying you need to go to a base plus system. You'll put some on. How much is some? 120 units. Pick a round number. And then you're going to do what? You're going to wait. Because if you wait, you get look really smart. You're going to have time always on your side. We know that corn, if we drew a chart here, and Jim Hedges will show it to you early, you know, later on, but if you drew a cart chart of corn, so we were planting here, so you put the little seed in the ground here, and then it starts to grow, and as it grows, and you look at the corn usage chart, and you're going to see that all the nitrogen use is late in the season. And that's the way the new genetics are being raised. These guys are vicious feed feeders later on. They like nitrogen late. So when does this curve happen? Well, this curve here, this goes along, and about right here, we're at V10. Where's V10? Shoulder high, head high corn. 12, V12's head high for me. V10's here. So if you have a case of deer road gator, you can go in that V10 corn and you can put your nitrogen on right here and now you're going to look really, really smart because you're going to have yourself positioned for success. If you put it on out here, the big question mark is how many dollars should I spend and how much should I put on? So let's talk about base plus and how it's going to be. So let's say we went out in the hydrus in the fall. We position 125 pounds of anhydrous of NSERV. We're going to have a session that shows you what anhydrous bars look like as far as evenness. We got technology that says, well, why would you run a bar? I've seen bars be 60% off, 60% off from shank to shank. That's not precision. That's not something you'd be proud of. And so you would go out and position this in the fall. You would come back and plant, and then you just be patient, and you're going to wait. And so in our program, we're not using anhydrous. We use the planter. So we come out and we put 25 pounds on pre-plant. Now this is corn on beans. Corn on corn, we're going to be in more than 120 range. But our corn on beans, we're going to sit at 85 pounds. We put 25 on with weed and feed. And we put 60 on with the planter. And we put 30 on each row, on each side of the row. So the corn's right here. And it's a two by two by two. And so right here is our nitrogen, extremely happy corn. And so that's, that's what our program is. Then at that stage, now you've waited, now we go to what we call right rate. And what's right rate? Right weight is where we talk about what is the perfect nitrogen to finish the race. 
We know we can split that corn stalk of a jackknife and we can look where the styrofoam is. Really hard to say how much nitrogen needs to present it. So we've worked on technology called soil scan. So we'll go out in the field, we'll take a probe, and you can see us here, we're probing down 12 inches. We're gonna dump it in this bucket. And we're gonna say, where's the gas tank on this field? Is it down half, down to an eighth, flat out, ready to run out? Because right now the corn looks good. So we go to soil scan and it tells us exactly where we're at. And it's gonna help you figure out what you need to apply. At that stage, you come out and you're gonna put the, the sprayer in the field and you can see here we're at V10, V12 corn and we're coming in here and we're doing what? We're adding and positioning nitrogen at the right time. We're at the right place. And so we're gonna put it not in the center of the row. You're gonna hear a lot about that today. Gonna to see some results about colders in the center where nitrogen moves versus putting it right next to the plant. So in my program, we're on a four-step program. So we do one pre-plant. We're gonna do one with the planter. We're gonna do two with Y-drop. Y2, because I wanna get it and hit the bullseye exactly, right in the center. And so in our operation, we're saying, let's let time go by. So we came in and we did a pass right then and we put on, so we had 85 on, I told you. We come in and put another 100 units on flat rate. No variable rate here. Pass number two was gonna be our variable rate nitrogen. Pass number one at V10, we come in and put, so we're sitting at 185 pounds and we haven't gone out since. Why haven't we gone out since? Soil scan says you got all you need. There's no need to put any more on. The plants are saying what? This giant is saying what? We're okay. He says we got all we need. The ear, if we looked at it, ear says what? I'm happy. Looks like the bird's got a hold of him on the end. But the ear, it says I'm happy. So this is irrigated corn. And so it's saying, I'm in a really good day and I'm having a good day. And so, but in our system, if we're gonna come in twice and we're in 20 inch corn, we're gonna need to think about trams. This is where our planter is today. We run three different planters. We got DB60s, I love them. And we got the ability to slide those inner rows at the 120 gauge and we make them 18 inch rows on either side and we got a 24 inch tram. Works really well at V10. But if you're going to come back in at super high corn, like you're going to see us run in today, we're going to change our program. So for Greg, I'm going to go to a 30-inch tram. And I'm going to force my 20-inch corn heads to pick 15-inch, you know, on that row. We do it all the time. I use our 20-inch heads to pick all of our 30-inch plots. Sometimes there's two rows coming in. Sometimes there's one. It's doable. And so our program next year, I'm going to have a 30-inch tram. So now I can, at a minute's notice take my Hagee sprayer and I can go out and we can play ball. On our last pass through, we're dual tank. So my last pass that we made, we didn't add any nitrogen, but we put fungicide on. So I ended up going through my corn four times or four passes. We just didn't have any in here. All we had here was headline amp. So to me, that's gonna be the farming system of the future where you can go left or right at a second's notice and you're always right and you're not out of the money. Let's take a look at it, see how it works real time. Move this corn over. So we went out in a 150 acre field. And we said, let's set out some blocks. And for years, back in 2012, this is the machine I was running, colder straight down the 20 inch row. This is 20 inch corn. We're putting nitrogen on right at the center. And you can see it running in there and you can see the results. You can see the knife marks, can't you? I can find my pointer. You can see every 20 inch row, we got these, even in this wet year, look at the fracturing we got. I would almost bet you lunch that the nitrogen is still in that crack. Pretty nice yields, 251, I'm not mad about that at all. Then we come out and we said, well, what if we would take a colder cart like that, instead of taking the, let's take the colders off and put on Y-drop. 
This is a cart that went up to a friend of mine in northern Illinois. This guy farms a lot of acres. This is a 90-foot system with tracks. He's carrying 3,700 gallon of liquid on tracks. He does 130 acres to the fill. A neighbor here yesterday said, man, I leaned on the fence post and watched that thing run. And I said, that's amazing. So why drop running through corn that's boot high? Did it change the yield? Why would it change the yield? The same amount of in. Well, we positioned it not in the center of the row. We brought it in to the sweet spot right next to the stalk. And so we gained what? Seven and, seven and nine, we gained 16 bushel. And then we came back at V8 and we said, let's put a colder in at V8 corn. Now we're, now we're getting up there. And you can see the mark here easily, can't you? I can put my whole hand in there. Got my pocket knife here, measured two inches. You could stick your whole hand down in that crack at a colder V8. It was at running at 262. And then we said, well, let's put a wide drop in at V8. And you can see us running in here. Now all of a sudden things start to change. And by positioning in V8 corn, corn is shaded. Corn has had the right amount of in at the right spot. The yield jumped in the 290s. In the same corn, same field, plant the same day. Take it ahead, Tim. And you can see it there. Why drop at V8, 291. It's all about positioning at the right time, at the right place. Then we said, well, let's come back one more time. The second pass, and you can see it's in here at V12 corn, just a touch higher than V12. Yield didn't change a lot. Went to 293. So if I put that up on a bar chart for you, so you can see it, you can see the difference. So colder versus wide drop at boot high corn, and then a V8 corn, colder versus wide drop, and then coming back in on that last pass. But for me, this is the pass where we have our Hagee and our Miller split tank, where we can do two products at once, so I only have to go through the corn one time. 60-40 split on the tank. That Hagee's got a 1,600 gallon tank, and so we can put nitrogen on the 60%, the bigger side, Water and fungicide on the back. We're doing 17 gallon of water of headline amp. And then we're variable rating the nitrogen. It could be anywhere from 15 to 35 gallon, depending upon what it needs according to soil scan. But the profit is really what the key is. And the $3 corn market, this is what should get your motor running. And you start to see these kind of profits. This is what's going to keep the farm going. This is what's going to let you write a check to Deer and Case and Agco. Right, Russ? Yes. We should shake our head yes. That's right. Write a check to Agco for the next piece. And so those are things that we're doing. So advantages of, of a base plus system becomes very evident. 2012, we'd overspent. 2015, where we had to come back in. We showed you this field last year at the conference. You can see the strips. Wide drop, colder, wide drop. Go ahead, Tim, and show them exactly. So wide drops here at V16. Colder here at V6. All that rain took that nitrogen out. Same amount of N applied. And you start to see the, the differences in, in, in uh, bushels. 160 in the colder. Down here in the little better ground, we were, what, 290? But then you start to see the differences between them. And you start to see we're anywhere from, what, 90 to $300 difference on the wettest year in history. I'll just tell you, I need the 300 I want to make sure if there's $300 an acre out there that I'm going to grab it. Let's take a look at mineralization. Let's talk about it. What is it? Because it's exciting. You know, I've watched it for years. And we've paid attention to it for years. I remember when Tim was just a little guy. I told him one day he was running our R&D department. He's probably 19 or 20. And I said, Tim... If you could design me technology to measure Mike. Who's Mike? I'll show you Mike here. Put Mike up, Tim. And you can see Mike here. Now, there's a lot of Mike out there. This should get, this should get you excited. Mike is out there by the thousands of pounds. And he works really hard. He's working on organic matter here. Look at him go. You can see him spinning around. He's busy. He's on jet fuel. Everything's running good. What does it take to make Mike that active? Oxygen, water, the right heat, and fuel. Fuels your organic matter, fuels your nitrogen. He feeds on nitrogen, and he's happy. How many of them are out there? Serious amount. You look at science. You go into Ohio State, and you look it up on Google. It'll tell you, of course, they got a span. 
8 to 16, what do you think it is? Tons. You understand what I'm saying? 16,000 pounds to 32,000 pounds of mic. I like that. For a visual, think out here. That's 32,000 pound steers per acre. Whoa. I like that. But what happens if you and I aren't paying attention to good old Mike and his buddies? If you let pHs drop, bought a farm next to us. Knew it was probably a little tough. Soil tested it. Asked the grower, the tenant on it. He was retiring and he did come to us and said, would you like to buy it? I said, sure. You know, you always like to buy the ground that touches you. I asked him, I said, yeah, have you taken any soil tests lately? He said, oh, it's probably been 15 years, Greg. 4.9 to 5.6 pHs. What happened to Mike? Mike is no more. If you tell me you get your pHs to 5.6, you take 32 steers to 1. That's in science. That's documented. You let your pHs slip below 6 to 5.6, and Mike, you killed him. You take from 32,000 pounds to about 1 to 1,500 pounds is what the research shows you. So you and I, as managers of our farm, we need to be soil testing. We need to be measuring. If you ever come up to me at a farm show and you say, Greg, man, we're going to put on limestone this year, and we're doing a two and a half ton rate. Not right, shouldn't do this, but I would look at you in my mind, I immediately say, ah, oh, probably a bee grower. If you told me you need a 5,000 pounds of lime, and that's your normal farming operation, I'm not happy with you. We spread it from 1,000 to 1,500 every other year. We're in, and we don't let our pHs do the hill and valley. We just keep them like this. Why? Because of Mike. If I walked in your field from last year and I saw corn silks, silks, and I saw shucks on that field after a year now in August, I immediately know your pH is out of line. And I'd have to say something to you like, when's the last time you soil tested? So Mike's a good guy. What does he like? He likes residue. And you can see it here. And he creates, residue has what? A lot of value. You'll hear Jamie talk about it in his session. Jamie's going to tell you there's $100 an acre. Think of that. $100 an acre of value to that residue. Too many growers look at that corn harvest and they curse stalks and residue for year after year. It's a problem to handle. I look at it and I say, oh boy, that's a gold mine. And so we're always looking for options. And we said, if that's a blessing, which it is, how can we get more value faster? It takes five years for Mike to take this to total pocket change. Five years to eat this whole thing. Now, he's going to eat this immediately. He's got this gone immediately. Silks here, no problem. Probably in about, what, 30 days. Those are gone. But how about this right here? This guy is going to be a problem. You get the picture. You know what I was trying to do. I'm not going to work any harder at it. And so we said to our team, is there any way we could take it from five years to two and a half? I love speeding things up. And so our engineering team said, what if we created technology that would come in and cut all kinds of openings for Mike and then cut the corn about every seven inches? Because we want to leave big pieces. We know you got to plan in this next year, and we don't want to create confetti. But we said if we could leave openings for Mike, what would happen? And so we're going to talk about it out in the cornfield. And we're going to show it to you real time. And you're going to see pictures like this of residue of different corn heads. And it's reality. And so we're just saying, can we make the combine become a dollar generator for the following season? Then we take that residue that we've opened up and we incorporate it in with a ripper. And you can see here, this is a corn on corn field. We're getting ready to plant corn in here in 16. This is the fall of 15. And that ripper's set up right. So Tim's going to do a session for you on that. We have a new ripper point. That's what this pit here is all about. We're saying, 
How do we create an environment so you get all the value out of this mound? Because this is pretty solid berm. Most ripper points on the industry create a V. That's why they call V rippers. And we're saying, well, what if we could take and change the density up there, not to fines, but just to restructure it loose, but leave it intact, but knock all this down so that roots just migrate down through. So there'll be a session on that. Some of you will be heading there in just a few minutes. So it's really all about how do we create a large dinner plate for Mike? Organic matter is the key. A 1.8%, so this field has a sandy knob in it, and it goes down, and it goes down in the valley, and it goes down along to a creek. Let's take a look at it. We said what? Mike can do 15 to 20 pounds of N per organic point. 1.8, take a look at it in our hand. It's pretty sandy soil. You can see it there. And then you can see we measured it with technology. We said that's 45 pounds of nitrogen. We were able to soil scan to document how much Mike gave us free. You go to 2.7 organic, and immediately the free nitrogen goes up because there's more food. There's a bigger dinner plate. You can see it in our hand, and that was 70 pounds of free in this field at that spot. And then we go down into the heavy ground. And this is, we're fortunate. This is where a lot of our ground is, three to four. 107 pounds of free nitrogen this year that Greg didn't have to apply. And so Mike is a gift. You and I need to start thinking about it, utilizing it, and it's going to change the way we farm. So let's look at a field where we took advantage of Mike. We said, well, we know Mike's going to have a good day here. These two fields are right across from each other. The field on the right, on your right here, was planned for four pass, ended up only needing 185 pounds, hand checking, it's the row on top, hand checking here at what, 265? I picked these ears in here yesterday, and I can tell you it's going to go higher than 265. The kernels are deep. And so instead of 90,000 kernels per ear, they're going to be probably more like 80. If you do 80, it's probably going to be in the 285. But I really like being in the 0.7 club. On the other side of the road, there was a prescription with an agronomist. They made one pass of Y drop in a one pass system. And he put the whole load on, shooting for 260, put on 295 because it's 1.1, got his 260. But what, he spent 55 more an acre. We farm both sides. And so it's our equipment on both sides. I just don't own on the other side. Good corn. I am not at all mad. I am delighted that he's got 261 bushel or more on a 295 spread. So this is why we're telling you today, get yourself in a position where a base plus can work for you no matter what. Because I believe no matter whether it's 2012, 2015, 2016, a base plus program takes you in the driver's seat and it makes you really good at what you do. John, why don't you come down? These guys are getting hot. We're going to need to get them some free donuts and drink. While you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done here. You see our miller going through here. We got undercover working in here. This is July 19th. We got the boom on the top. You can see the boom spraying in the back. And we're using a product called Defold 5. Defold 5 is salt, salt water. And we're spraying this corn. This is 79-day corn on July 19th. It was tested about, we figured about 80 to 90% moisture. 4% of the kernels had a slight dent in them. But I knew I was going to have a party and all you were going to come on August 9th and 10th and 11th. And so I said, we got to kill this corn. And so we sprayed it. That's a $6 application. Here's how it looked on August 4th. And it moves fast. And so well, the day we sprayed it, it was between 80 and 90%. Today it's 18%. We took her down hard. But here's what I want to challenge you. Yesterday I was talking to the North Dakota guys. And they were telling me, Greg, he said, you don't understand our combines run when it's tough. He said, last year, the first day in the field, it was 20 below. I said, yeah, that's tough. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that deer has a combine that starts at 20 below. But um, I was thinking, why would we be harvesting that late? 
Well, you know the answer because that's just the way it is in northern states. But what if for $6 an acre, so I'm going to start testing this. If it's $6 an acre, I can take a product like Defold 5. We use it on our seed all the time. In fact, today they're starting to spray my seed acres, unfortunately. I never want to be the guy that goes first, but we'll probably have about 300 acres that they'll spray of our seed because we raise refuge corn. Refuge has got to come out ahead because they got to get it treated to all the plants to sprinkle it in the bag. So unfortunately, they'll probably kill about 300 acres of my seed. But what if you had 35% corn? So I've been able to do this three years now, salt and corn. And we know that in sunshine like we have today, you'll lose two and a half to three percentage points, okay? So if we could come in here and spray it, in this case, we said 19 days, that's what we had. We lost, what's 80? Never do math in front of a crowd. 80 minus 20, we lost 60 points. I, I rounded it off, so I didn't, didn't get crazy. So we lost 60 percentage points in 19 days. But if I lived in northern Minnesota, and I talk to a lot of you all, all the time, you say, Greg, our corn is 36% and hasn't moved down in two weeks. I'm just saying, if it was me, I would come across the top of this of default five, and two weeks later, I would pick 18% corn and kiss all the drying charges goodbye. Think about it. So I'm gonna test it. We got some 116 day full season corn. I'm gonna go out at 38% and I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna let it get down to 18% and we're gonna weigh it and we're gonna keep track of the drying charges. The rest of it I'm gonna harvest at 28% because that's where we harvest corn because that's where the highest yields come from year after year after year, wet corn. Corn gets here black layer the day after farm progress show, well the day after Labor Day, John, we'll start harvest. I don't worry about soybeans, I love them. Well, I like them. Loving would be a strong word, wouldn't it, John? I really like the price of them compared to corn. But so we'll harvest all the corn and we'll go get beans. But in this case, if I lived up north for $6 an acre, man, oh man, guys, I'm not sure that doesn't something you should put in your program. You would probably need to own a sprayer to do that, wouldn't you? Or you could probably do it with an airplane. But it's something to think about. John, I think we're probably... Time to move. They're getting restless. So let me understand something here. Okay. We invite all these fine folks here to learn how to grow more corn and yeah. plant health is important, and you tell them how to kill it. Well, that was only the meeting after the meeting. Okay. That wasn't the main meeting, how to kill it. Well, we did invite you here to uh, get a, a different perspective, a new perspective on, on growing corn. So that's what we're going to do the rest of the day.